Rome's responsibility for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. The gentleman who compiled all this inf information put it all in the book. You can find it. You can find this letter and source that he used in the court. Okay. He basically made this guy look like a complete idiot with the scandal that he was trying to do against this other guy that was trying to leave the Catholic faith. And this guy ended up, uh, Father Chinake, and he um, later on would visit Lincoln saying, you know, they're probably going to try to take you out. You've already you yeah. made them really mad. And he's like, I have no doubt that they will. And there's even a quote in 63 of Lincoln even say, if the American people knew how much the Catholic Church was distorting our education, blah, 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 blah then mm. yeah. this guy, I mean, this is a direct quote. And nobody is bringing this fact up um, that he, he realized if he had said anything that the Catholics were behind a lot of the motivation in the South or they were influencing and have workings down there, that this would turn into a religious war as opposed to just a civil war. And he says, that's going to be mm -hmm. 10 times worse than what we got right now. Welcome to Far Out with Faust, everybody. I am Faust Picho, and today I'm very excited to be joined by Brandon Kroll. Let me tell you about Brandon, what he's been up to. This guy is a, he is a data analyst at heart, whatever he says. He loves researching history, reading, writing. He, he loves fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. He loves writing about conspiracy facts, although he might mention them as theories. Those are some of his favorite topics to write about. He's uh he was president of his college's newspaper and book club, and while there, he was published in the school's literary journal twice for second place in a statewide writing competition. So he's also great with the pen or the keyboard, whatever you prefer these days. Brandon, thank you so much for beaming, beaming in, brother. It's great to have you on the show. I appreciate being on your show. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, man. So so let me tell you, full disclosure, how I, I came across Brandon. He, he follows me on Instagram. And a lot of his content, uh, you know, very much it cross pollinates with mine. And he he has continuously commented in a way that is very um, generous with his knowledge and helpful towards whatever post that I've whatever crazy post I've put up. And uh, and his comments always are provocative and, um, and and they're great. So finally, I was like, hey, I can I gotta. I got to pick this guy's brain. I mean, he has a lot of knowledge, some stuff that I never heard of. And uh, so I was like, dude, you got to come on. And he's like, all right. <laughs> so, uh, Brandon, what am I missing, man? Um, anything about you that I that I should have mentioned that I didn't? Well, it, it, I guess one thing is like um, my educational aspect background, like we were talking prior, um, I only made it to sixth grade because there was a lot of issues going on with the homeschooling aspect we were, we were going to do a move didn't do a move it ended up you know getting postponed schooling was all packed up so i just ended up taking a ged and then uh, going straight to college so see so see so and you were you were adopted you mentioned right yeah f4 okay wow um and so you got a ged in sixth grade from sixth grade to ged yeah <laughs> wow I've never, I mean, I have a few friends that dropped out when we were in like ninth and 10th grade who ended up getting their GED, but I've never heard of anyone getting it so young. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it was kind of like, it was either that or I'm just going to be in school for forever. But I was like, you know what, I got to, I got to bite the bullet and I get done with this. So I did. Cool, man. I was going to, I was going to ask you about that a little later, but, uh, you know, how, so then, so then you you still found a way into college and and more schooling, right? Mm -hmm. So you had a thirst for knowledge. You didn't. You didn't. I mean, a lot of people just would have said the hell with it, but but you pursued it anyway. And you, you I know you went to college and you mm -hmm. and you got into writing, right? I tried to do uh, journalism because I, I first thought that that was going to be a thing that I would be interested in. But the the way the classroom in the school was worked it was like almost like the teachers were almost incredibly nervous all the time because a lot of them would be just graduating themselves then starting to teach so i it, it just it didn't give me the right vibe check and um even going down there i mean that was uh i i wasn't exactly what you call exceptional i had a little bit of a rough a rough side to me first getting down there i, I was on a first name basis with a lot of the deans <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. So I came back to Connecticut and I made Dean's List at the my, at my local community college. I honestly did not know what that was. I had to Google it because I thought I was in trouble. And I was like, I'll drink the mail. I'm on another list. <laughs> I, uh, that's fascinating. That's that's hilarious. You're Show up for Shin Schooler, total disclosure. I was like, I, I had no idea what that was. So when I got that for like a couple of years in a running, I was like, okay, well, that's that's new. <laughs> That's hilarious, man. Yeah. Um, that's cool though. Good for you, dude. It take you know, look, it's not easy being an orphan. That is a big thing to overcome. A lot of people yeah. can't and don't. So kudos to you there. And the fact that you were like, you know what? I I, I want to learn more. I'm gonna I'm gonna go where where I can to do that. Good for you, dude. That's awesome. So before we jump into some of these topics I'm I'm excited about. Tell me tell me about this. Um tell me what this means. I think this will give people a little idea of you too. In one of your posts, you said that you are 100% Christocrat, which that's more self-evident than some of these other ones. You said you're 65% Carlinist, which yep. I was like, Carlinist, and 25% Zappian, mm -hmm. uh, Frank Zappa. Tell me who those two cats are and and what 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 you were talking about with, uh, with this. Yeah. Uh, on the following slide, I, I go into a little bit more detail. I'm like, I'm also 10% um, politically agnostic as Sylvester Stallone one time said on Hannity and the Carlin aspect is a lot of times when I'm watching George Carlin oh George Carlin okay yes yes that yes. next slide I went a little bit more in detail but um a lot of the stuff that I watch of his minus his atheistic view in abortion I I, I liked a lot of his um views his cynicisms I, I don't yeah. see a lot of comedians as just comedians I see that more as a philosopher with with a comedic perspective on outlook of life and if we're paying attention we can actually learn a lot of things and i look at carlin as a modern day uh, diogenes the stuff that he calls out the things that he's trying to relate to his audience he's almost he's telling the audience truths and he's laughing at them and they're laughing back at him but he's like if you understood what i'm saying this should be resonating with you i'm talking about you right <laughs> no he he he's a prophet he is just so far ahead of his time. Just incredible. The things that were coming out of his mouth. I mean, he was so far ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. My God, if he was around now, they would, they would have had to cancel him about 50 times over. They would have and he would have, life. you know, had his finger out the whole time. Yep. Like, he was amazing, man. So uh, just incredible, dude. Yeah. Um, um, and then so so you're also, you're very, uh, you're very Christian. Yeah. Um, I... <laughs> Which is ironic because I, with my upbringing, there was a, um, what do you call it? Like, kind of like a hypocritical undertone. My dad was very uh, adamant with us with like our, our reading or schooling, like make sure the curriculum was very Christian based, Christian background. But there were issues going on in the household that was, Not how do I put that delicate? Yeah, <laughs> it was very <laughs> questionable. Let's just put it that way. And the fact yeah. that I'd still would want to stick to my faith through that i think a lot of people probably would have been like it's all a joke it's all a sham yeah. but i saw past of what is based on the individual and what is actually you can look past that and focus on um the core of your faith not necessarily yeah. the individual that distorted it good for you again you're an ex you're an exception you know uh so I just got back from, uh, I was with Greg Braden for four days and he was showing these amazing pictures. Uh, he has like a, a Holy Land trip in Jerusalem and, you know, he's like showing us, you know, this is where they, they laid Jesus's body and um, really powerful uh, sites. And I mean, they're just, he visited now, they, they've, the, the home of Mary Magdalene. And, and so that's actually becoming its own now that they're discovering more and more about uh, Mary Magdalene and how you know, how much part she played with Jesus's life. And that's not a very controversial thing for people who are Catholic, you know, because right. you see, it doesn't say that in the Bible and the gospels that are offered in the traditional text. But it, when you get into the new texts, very much, she becomes very much a part of his life. I'm wondering where you, where you fall on that. If you are like more traditional or I'd say I lean more traditional only for the reason being is that his purpose wasn't for um, mating. It was it was more so of creating. I mean, I could go on a whole rabbit trail if you want right now explaining the aspect of communion and why I would say that would 
not necessarily like debunk, but it would it would put a very counteractive argument on the on the little evil there of trying to see yes or no. Mm, it's fascinating. Um yeah, you know, I was raised Catholic, so I, I, you know, I know the tradition a lot, but it was always very hard to believe. And I always thought, okay, like, I don't understand how, why is there a demonization of, of women, you know, and, and, and femininity in general has been kind of taken out of, and this is, you know, it's obviously a very Catholic thing. And then you have the whole thing with like, why are the priests so confused? Oh, I don't know. You know, why aren't they married? What's the point? What, you know, I, I have a lot of problems with it, but, um, we we don't need to get we don't need to get into it too much. Um, no, and, and even what you're talking about, um, if anything, if you if if you want to go into like stuff that makes people at my church upset, just start asking about the verse Genesis six four with the sons of God coming down having you know affairs with the daughters of men, because yeah. this starts a whole rabbit trail of issues <laughs> and it starts debunking the thing of where Christ is on this because a book I was reading by Michael uh, Doctor Michael Heiser reversing Mount Hermon, he was explaining how the whole genealogy of Christ is showing how he loves women and how they utilize to hit, hit the buildup of who he became, why it was important to have every single one of those women represented. They didn't say all the traditional ones that we hear in the Bible. It talked about the ones yeah. that were barely mentioned. And then when you explore the background of each one of those individuals, the the the, the metaphorical uh, power behind that is just like, wow, he's actually very much pro-women. So the idea of condensing it and just saying like, oh no, women are supposed to shut up, just listen to their husbands, you know, they have no yes. place to say, totally not biblical, totally not biblical, just like slavery. Yeah. It's just that when I was reading about the Knights of the Golden Circle and their stance, like saying, oh yeah, I was set down by the Jehovah God that it's an ordained institution. It's just like, no, it's not. And I don't know if you're drawing this conclusion. There was a time and place for it. And it, it wasn't necessary at that time when they were trying to install uh, like uh, the golden circle, which again, I don't know why history doesn't talk about it. But anyways, we'll re we'll revisit that because I'm interested. Yeah. But yeah. speaking of slavery, you know, um, you you have some fascinating information about the Civil War, and I know it's one of the areas that you you've accumulated a lot of knowledge of, and and it you know there's a like my my eleven year old was just learning about the Civil War and he's in fifth grade and you know and I'm like what are they telling you <laughs> I'm like tell me what they're telling you so I can try to uh, fill you in on you know what's really going on but you know you you mentioned how Ro how Rome was involved uh, in in the assassination of of Lincoln and um, you know like most presidents who get knocked off there's usually a lot of reasons that build up to, mm -hmm. to have them put on this, this list, you know, and, but, but Rome is something that I've, you know, I, I mean, I know the Vatican's God, it's the Vatican itself is just such a, it, it, it's just like, I don't know what good has ever come out of the Vatican. I don't, I, I feel like it was designed for the opposite purpose of what people are taught in the Catholic religion that it's designed for. But, um, you know, tell me how, first of all, most people believe the Civil War is about slavery. Abraham Lincoln is the hero. You know, he he was morally against, and and, I, and I'm not doubting that this is actually true, but of course we know that there were a lot more things involved in the reason why there was a civil war in America. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, enlighten me about um, some of the things that I probably don't know and then go into, you know, how Rome was involved with Lincoln's assassination. So you kind of want to build up of what the Civil War led to? Yeah, like, you know, I, I, most people have a decent idea of, of I mean, of it, and maybe not so decent these days, but, you know, we, we know that he was shot um, by John Wilkes Booth. Um, yes. Yep. We, we know it was in a theater, right? Mm -hmm. um, we know that he was a hero and that he, he went to war with the South, and it was a grueling war. Uh, and that, it, you know, everyone, most people believe that it was over slavery. Um, and most people don't know why he was shot. They think that, that uh, Booth was a nut, that he was insane, that he was, you know, the typical story about the assassins in our country is they're lone, uh, insane gunmen, uh, hell-bent on some political manifesto, as if that makes people yep. 
homicidal. <laughs> fill, fill, fill us in on what, what they're getting wrong. Oh, gosh. I, I might be going for a bit here. Oh. <laughs> Go for it. I guess the best way to define it is that um, during the 18, early 1800s with the, um, around 1812, 1815, whenever Haiti had their revolution, this freaked the South out big time because they're a newly formed country. They're newly formed colonies. They're seeing that slaves can revolt and then, you know, take power and reclaim the island as their own. This is what was the beginning stages of what was setting the, the South's mentality of we cannot have that down here. I guess that's what you could say was the origins of keeping it solely in a uh, racial class, as in with skin tone, as you know, because we always skip over the French, uh, sorry, the uh, Irish aspect of the slaves that were there. But well, what's the Irish aspect of the slaves that were there? So a lot of them, um, one of them was actually a grandfather of mine. He was on the Mayflower. His name was Soul, and that's S-O-U-L-E. And apparently he was an indentured Irishman that was going along with one of the families there. Again, indentured is your slave or servant for right. a certain period of time, and then you gain your freedom after you've worked off whatever loan, money, is um, multiple issues, like money lender issues. Uh, your father did he owed something. There's multiple aspects of how you would get into the indentured um, field where you just wanted to book passage and the other person paid for it for you. And then they, you would work for them for a number of years and then you get, you know, yeah, you get your freedom back. So and the Irish were treated horrible. I'll probably be doing a post on that because I was reading an article and we totally bypassed like one of the first slave owners in America. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, he was the first, his name was Anthony Johnson. And he went to court to ensure that his black slave stayed under his uh, roof, whatever, whatever his contract was actually over. He he went to court and saying, no, it's a it so it's it. property. Yes. Yes. That uh, we totally bypassed that in history. So I'm like, yeah. Anyways, so going back to like 18, 14, 15, somewhere within that period of time, this is when the wheels began turning in the South with how can we start fixing this issue? And then you had... The uh, the Amistad incident in the 1840s, where they made the movie with um, Anthony Hopkins okay. and uh, Matthew McConaughey, I absolutely loved it. I was actually impressed that Spielberg touched on that subject. But again, mm. 20 something years ago, a lot of them were touching stuff that I was like, okay, I guess yeah. that makes sense. But it, it was very insightful for me because it helps connect a lot of the dots of the books that I read and getting a visual perspective. I'm like, okay, that makes a lot more sense now. So by the 1850s. We started getting a group that was coming up into play, and I don't know all their names because I read a ton. I don't remember all their names, but now, Knights of the Golden Circle book is uh, for like 35 bucks. You can get it on Amazon if you're interested in learning how they forged in Texas. They started creating an empire that they wanted from the Confederacy States to California, Mexico, a good portion of all the uh, South American countries, so like Venezuela almost. It included Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica. That was going to be the golden circle of slavery. And basically, we have our own vision of how we want this half of the world to go. Whatever you guys want to do in the North, be our guest. We, right. we don't want to deal with that anymore. And so their vision was to have this already in play. And when you're hearing about John Brown, are you familiar with that guy? Mm, not off the top of my head. He was the individual that was kind of called like the the crazy, uh, what do you call it? Um, try to think of the term. Uh, is it abolitionist? Abolitionist, I think it was, right? Abolishing slavery? Oh, so he was he was for the end of it. Yes, but he was going to do it via violent means. But what I've been reading, again, this is strictly theory. I do not have definitive proof. But one of his first incidents or acts of violence was against a guy in Kansas. He rode up to the guy's house in the middle of the night, pulled him out, and his sons and him beat him up with, like, this broadsword, and they freaking killed the guy. But what I'm reading with the Golden Circle is that they're from Texas, but they were all the way up into Kansas, Missouri region. I'm beginning to think that John Brown was like, you guys want to go violent? I'm going to go violent with you guys because I want to end this in a righteous way. John Brown um, actually made it all the way to Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and he was going to be arming the slaves down there by taking over the um, military, wherever they were storing all the ammo and stuff like that, and then go through the South, start arming the slaves for a revolt. 
what people don't know is that John Wilkes Booth was present for that whole incident. He he came down when they when the Virginia militia, this is where Harper's Ferries was located. They were starting to freak out. They're like, okay, we need to get everybody down there. Uh John Wilkes Booth was at a theater at the time. I'm not sure if it was the Ford's Theater or another one. It was a Bring Ford Theater, yeah. Yeah. Um I, again the book I read another book on him. And he was at one of those theaters and he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna drop my job and I'm going to join the militia that head down there and stop this whole thing. And they get there in the aftermath. They make sure that there was this group that was maybe going to be uh, doing a jailbreak for John Brown didn't go down because of all these extra guns that were around. And John Wilkes Booth actually talked with John Brown, and he was totally against abolitionists. He didn't like them at all. And um, he basically, when he saw John Brown hang, he said to the guy next to him, he says, I'm never going to be going down like that. If it ever comes, push comes to shove, I'm not going to go out like that. It just seemed like a long, drawn-out process. He didn't he didn't like that aspect at all. So the Knights of the Golden Circle, I'm not sure how or when, but I do know that Booth had a tour that went through Oklahoma and the Texas region, and that's possibly when they recruited him because he was a member. And that's something that a lot of times, again, not a crazed gunman, because if you're part of an organization and you know what they're... That's right root causes and stuff like that you start connecting some more dots and again i've read these other guys that are part of this you know civil war association this group blah blah and they're kind of like no some people theorize this but i start connecting dots and names and i start making a little bit of a yeah comp- comp- compiling of oh okay i know who was the one that recruited you i'm now the guy i know now the guy that hit, connected you to this guy and in the aftermath it's just damning all the way and that's the book that i posted that you were referring to so Booth, um, was how, when he was thirteen, I believe he was, he was thirteen years old. He talked to a gypsy lady, and she did a palm reading, and mm-hmm. she says that you you will have a quick and fast life, and you will go out with the nation screaming your name. Wow, that that's what he said. That's what she told him as a prophecy, reading his palm. But how do we know that? Because. He, did, he, did he write that or did he say, tell someone that? He was there, I think, with his sister, if I remember correctly. I think her name was Asia Booth. And or she, he ran up to her and said, this is what she said. And he kind of was chuckling himself. He's like, yeah, sure. Um, but that's actually, lo and behold, as he was dying, he couldn't move his arms and his hands. But he is asking someone to lift them up. And they did. And the first thing, he, he looks at both hands after he said, Mama. He looked at both his hands and said, useless useless then he died wow yeah and i'm like whoa talk about a full circle of having a flashback your whole life flashing before your eyes right before you die i don't know um so booth was recruited by the knights of the golden circle this is my best thing that i got going on and when he went up into montreal canada this is where they started planning this is where they started coordinating how are we going to take out lincoln and there's a quote in the book, um, let me try to get the name, Montreal City of Secrets. And as I was talking on Nick's podcast, um, whoever edited his book, um, I feel so bad for him. He only needed like 110 pages to tops, but a lot of it started repeating itself. Yeah. Or like, it was just like, they just threw it all into the book. They're just like, we're not even going to bother editing. But what I did find in there is that um, this Montreal was where the Confederacy had their hub, their main hub for their secret service because it was perfectly perched right into New York, to Vermont, to getting into all the northern cities, especially New York, which is where they were building the Monitor, uh, where they had their, uh, they were burning several cities at one point for sabotage. It's also Mm -hmm. where they coordinated the St. Albans raid. A lot of people aren't familiar with that, but with the the contingency of uh, Confederacy soldiers that went into St. Albans, robbed several banks, then rode back into Canada. That was all planned in Montreal. Wow. Uh, yeah, that caused a huge incident in 1864. And they were all like, are you serious? You guys were planning an invasion, basically, a neutral territory, and you guys didn't do jack about it. So that caused a mm. whole scandal and almost got us back into a war with England after the Trent Affair. Um, Yeah, but Booth was up there, and he even bragged that even if Lincoln gets in again to this next election, or if he doesn't, 
he says he's he's going to be meeting his uh, I think Karam Karam something. Basically, it was a term that when all the balls are going to fall into the place with the holes, this is going to be his last uh, time ever, ever as president. So the fact that he made that little braggadocious claim and this guy was, a, he witnessed it, he, he talked about it later on. It was like, okay, so this wasn't just a crazed gunman. This is a record of witness having a conversation with him over a pool table that this was going to go down. Uh, what was what, but why was Booth so invested? Why did he have such animosity and hatred for for Lincoln? I mean, I was saying, you know, I mean, he sounds like you know, a, like a a sophisticated militia KKK member. You know what I mean? Like he like a there seems to be a hatred. Um, that, that I don't I'm not sure where it comes from, but I, I just I still understand. It still takes someone who's willing to sacrifice their life. Mm -hmm. who's willing to die uh to 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 walk up to a president in a theater like that right I mean, that is uh that's great how did he go from you know what te what seems to be you know like you know a, a, a militia a militiaman you know a, a military person who is strategizing to ah oh, fuck it you know let's just go kamikaze here and uh, i'll just take him out myself how do, how do how do we get to that and that's, that's what a lot of people don't talk about, is that there was originally a plan to kidnap Lincoln to end the Civil War. And this was actually, I think it was a lieutenant or a captain, I'm forgetting his name, but he was the one that pitched the idea saying, what if we get him when he's going to visit his wife's uh, little cottage, whatever is connected to the family, and we could, we could grab him, we'll run to, to down into Richmond, Virginia, we'll basically then make a bargaining chip saying we're going to end the war right now, we'll give you back your president. Yeah. You know, all done. And basically, uh, <laughs> through a fluke, um, there was a contingency of 24 cavalry soldiers that decided to join Lincoln on that trip. Mm. And they're like, okay, there's only six to eight of us. That's not going to work. Nah. So things had to start getting escalated. The original plan with Booth, from what all the stuff that I've gathered, it was supposed to be another abduction. But things didn't go according to plan. They basically were like, okay, we're going to have to upgrade now because... We're not, we're not going to yeah. be able to do it that way. So I think this was the second contingency plan, but I think part of it, Booth has always didn't like the things that Lincoln was doing. In the other book that I've read, he, Booth was incredibly generous. He was actually a, a real gentleman. He would like help and advise people on stage where to stand, how to recite their lines. Um, he was an individual that made sure people got certain gigs and stuff like that. He, he was his dad was a prominent actor, also a Mason. Well, his brother was the most famous actor walking around, right at the time. Yes. And he hated living in the shadow of his brother. So there was I'm a sure. little bit, a little bit of that. It wasn't his main motivation at all. Um, towards the night of though, there was like a theater assistant guy that he was at a bar with, and he's and the guy even made a comment to Booth saying, "You're never going to be as great as your brother or your dad." I'm like, well, that's... Yeah. That's and then like I think it was like within five eight minutes of that phrasing being said, um, Booth was in the theater, shot Lincoln, jumped down from the stage, and as he was running in the back, he he cut that guy with his dagger. Oh really? Yeah. Look, just little things like that. When I'm reading, I'm just like, holy cow! Like there, there's so many little details that build up to who the guy yeah. was, what his lifestyle was. He was an incredible womanizer. Um, he has he had five pictures of women in his coat pocket. One of them he was engaged to. Mm -hmm. Never talk about that. Wow. He was at Lincoln's second inauguration. We never talk about that. Wow. Yeah. It's so, so this is fascinating because where, so where, you know, obviously we know that the elites are involved. Whenever yes. there's a war, the elites are involved. So where, where, how, where do they fit in, in, in this equation? What, I mean, I'm sure they were backing both the North and the South because that's what they've learned to do and do well, you know, Correct. back back every horse so you can't lose. But, you know, they usually have one horse that that they're they're more riding than the other, that they have more, right. you know, they would like to see win more, and that's the one they'll invest more in. Right. Um which which horse were they backing and what was their involvement in this? Were they pro or or I mean obviously they were probably pro because in anything that is Pro industry, regardless of its ethnic eth ethics or morality, they're for right. you know. Right. Um, so I imagine they were more on on the set, side of the South, right? Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. They were more pro side of the South, and that's where it connects to the Catholic Church in the book that I was reading. Um, the minute the papacy basically declared the South its its own sovereign country, the North had a huge huge desertion or people just leaving ranks not you know they're like i'm not doing it anymore and the guy listed the numbers of how many were catholics that bailed during this time a lot of are saying this is where we started getting the draft riots i believe in the movie with uh leonardo dicaprio and um what's his face <laughs> last little yeah. geeks you, you guys will know who it is yeah yeah daniel day lewis that's the guy yeah that's yeah. where that whole scenario where they were doing the draft riots and stuff like that that games in new york that was all going on during this time. Oh, okay, okay. Again, multiple things were at play. Yes, there was some racial issues and race riots and stuff like that. But it was because people were basically saying, why am I fighting this war anymore? Especially if the Catholic Church basically approves, gives their thumbs up of saying this is its own country. In the right. South, the, pe the bad guys, who they had in play was uh, Judah Benjamin. And he was in charge of the Secretary of War at first, and then he ended up being the guy in charge of the Secret Service. Hmm. So this is their little connection there. He was the only Jewish member of the cabinet down in the Confederacy. And again, I, I would love to just write a book or just do posts on the cabinets of both sides because you hmm. learn so much from the personal lives of each individual in the cabinet. What's their motivations? What did they do in their personal life? Yeah. Um. So yes, they were definitely betting on the South. Uh, what, what's the name of the place? Um, drawing a blank up the name, but this is where the 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 ship, the Alabama, was made, and the Alabama was a huge. Uh, what do you call it? The 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 blockade that was controlling the South. The Alabama yeah. was basically a rogue hunting ship that was sinking Union ships all over. They went to the China Seas. They hit European. Uh, Union vessels they hit up in Massachusetts everywhere they wow. they were notorious and this was built a uh, Liverpool that was it they were bu built in Liverpool England when mm. we get the Trent affair going on I think this was in 62 63 and they captured the two Confederacy guys that were going over there as emissaries mm. that merely propelled England into joining they literally sent soldiers that were already north in Canada. They sent a guy down to talk to Lee, and he actually witnessed the forces on the field. He's like, you got to skip the army, but these guys are loyal to you. That's impressive. He was giving compliments. Mm -hmm. They were coordinating all kinds of battle stuff. They were going to send a whole bunch of steamers across the ocean. This is where Lincoln was like, crap, I think we're going to have to turn over the uh, the emissaries yeah. and going to have to call this off because I cannot fight two fronts. But this right. is what they actually were wanting. This is why they did the St. Albans raid in 64. They kept trying to irk and getting the uh, support, the an additional alliance of either France and or England to just join and help tip the scales of the battle. This was actually one of the primary reasons why Lincoln was signing the Emancipation Proclamation, because both of those countries, while they were talking a big game over in Europe about possibly joining the Confederacy, he knew that both of those countries had banned slavery. So if yeah. you signed the Emancipation Proclamation, this is a double-edged sword saying, if you guys join, you'll be joining the side that's pro-slavery still, and that's totally hypocritical of what your yeah. side says you stand for now. So it was a double-edged, because even though people are trying to take one quote out of context, saying if he could end the war without ending slavery, and again, you have to understand his mentality is that he's like, I, I, this is what they want, I get it, but if I could end the war, well, Everyone tries to amplify that and saying, oh, he was totally racist. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I know. I, I don't believe that. I don't still I angry. think that, you know, I think he saw and had a problem with um, slavery. He did. You know, it, it, absolutely. I think he did. I think he was, you know, and there was a lot of reasons why he went to war. But I, I don't I don't I don't believe that the, the hype about, oh, he was actually, you know, I don't think it's that ever that simple um not because he's written there's a lot of reports about him being examples when he was like yeah seven six years old the first time he saw a black guy was pull, pull, pulling a cart like an like an ox and yeah. he, that was what the first thing that resonated with him is just like how can somebody be so inhumane as to do that to somebody else yeah the second incident was he was down in louisiana during his riverboat days 
and he witnessed a slave auction going on there and that really triggered him off he literally told his guys like i got to get out of here i can't stand another minute watching that wow. one so when you're looking at what was pre-lincoln it doesn't sound like he was pro slavery at all to me it sounds like yes i understand they have their preferences and whatnot but every time I'm looking at instances with Lincoln, he was always a guy that went up against the crowd. And yeah. Even the Spanish American war, he said something where he's like, how do we know where the borderline is? And right. that, that made every, all of his colleagues were pissed at him. Like, why do you gotta be the one guy that's asking that question? Mm -hmm. Like, I just want to spend, you know, uh, union blood. I just don't want to uselessly throw it out there. This is, this is not a war that we need to be doing. So right. he wasn't pro war and maniac. I mean, you got to look into Buchanan. Um, I was getting an argument with a lady online. I'm like, you know what? I'm not even going to continue. But I gave her all these references and quotes of how to support my argument. And she just kept saying, well, did you read this author's book? I'm like, well, is you like that's referring me to the CDC at this morning? I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm giving you yeah, five exactly. Like, you're just you're telling like, me this one author who's proclaiming the tyrant narrative, you know? Yeah, of course. That, that's his story, right? Right, right. Um, pe people, man. Uh, and to go, continue with what you were saying, supporting both sides, this is where we're going down the rabbit hole, both books, um, Edwin Stanton, who was secretary of the war under Lincoln, he was a backstabbing Scott. Uh, yeah, not a good guy. Mm. He, um, his brother-in-law was in Montreal. He checked in directly after Ellie uh -huh. by the name of Sarah Slater in the hotel where it was known to be a huge Confederacy hub. And he used his own name. Now, if this is a time of war, I don't think you're going to be an idiot in not knowing the name of the National uh, International Police Agency right. of the Union. You're going to know who it is. You're not using an alias, and you're signing in directly after somebody who is known to be a, a Booth conspirator later on. Mm -hmm. So him and another guy, Lafayette Baker, who is in charge of the Secret Service for the Union, blah, blah, blah. He's like one of Edwin Stanton's most trusted guys. They were up there in 64. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of backroom dealing. In, eight, in 64, October, there was a cotton for contraband deal that was being made by Lincoln. And this is one of those scandalous things. This is right before election. You're doing this in the middle of a wartime, but they were going to make a deal with people in the South, say, we'll give you some contraband, like guns and stuff like that, but we need cotton. Remember, this is at least three wow. four years into a war. Your industries are kind of in a crappy situation. Right. At the same time, you really want to keep funding the the enemy so right. this whole deal was going on and while this was going on uh stanton the secretary of state he sent he sent a guy up there edwin stanton sent his guys up there so there was all it's like a game of thrones thing everybody's sending up their secret agents to get their own agenda going on yeah to how they end this edwin stanton uh once booth was dead he had booth's journal or diary and by the time he turned it over, there were like 19 pages that were missing. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. I'm sure. The guy, Lafayette Baker, he ended up dying of arsenic poisoning. Go figure. Yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's, just, it's one thing after the other after the other. And I'm just like, Edwin Stanton, you su you freaking stabbed him in the back. He knew I as wonder... early as March or, or late February. Cause they're, in, in Montreal, they were all bragging about it. They knew what was going to be coming up. Yeah. Um, And he knew as early as March that this was going to be going down and he didn't do anything to stop it. So my theory is that behind every assassination of this magnitude, there is a strong, um, you know, cabal, Illuminati, new world order, uh, on, you know, momentum carrying it in, right. You know, we're already, um, funding, you know, everything from, you know, whatever kind of uh, conditioning that needs to go on into the minds of the people involved, you know, it's all put into play uh, right. and and put into play in, in every level that, that is possible. You know, and I'm wondering, and it, as soon as you mentioned Rome and, you know, I'm like, okay, so then, then the Illuminati was involved because they had direct ties to Rome. In fact, yeah. you know, many would argue that that is the representative of Rome, you know, the, right. the black nobility, the Illuminati, that's where they come from. You know, and they have their hand in virtually every ev um, world event of that nature. So, right. um, I'm, I'm, tell me how they, the, you know, you know, how did they affect their influence? Because this is what they do so well. So basically, how they got onto 
how Lincoln got onto their crap list is that back, I think it was 38 or in the 40s, whenever he was practicing law as his main thing, he, he defended a gentleman in Illinois who was basically being accused by a Jesuit priest. And um, Lincoln basically, with his way of words and getting a little witness to just come in and sign an affidavit, you can find this stuff in the book. The guy, um, what was it? Uh, Rome's responsibility for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. The gentleman who compiled all this inf information put it all in the book. You can find it. You can find this letter and source that he used in the court. Okay. He basically made this guy look like a complete idiot with the scandal that he was trying to do against this other guy that was trying to leave the Catholic faith. And this guy ended up, uh, Father Chinike, and he um, later on would visit Lincoln saying, you know, they're probably going to try to take you out. You've already you're, yeah. you made them really mad. And he's like, I have no doubt that they will. And there's even a quote in 63 of Lincoln even saying, if the American people knew how much the Catholic Church was distorting our education, blah, 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 then mm. like, yeah. this guy, I mean, this is a direct quote. And nobody is bringing this fact up um, that... He, he realized if he had said anything that the Catholics were behind a lot of the motivation in the South or they were influencing and have workings down there, that this would turn into a religious war as opposed to just a civil war. And he says, that's going to be mm -hmm. 10 times worse than what we got right now. Yeah. As a, and as a guy that would pace the, the rooms um, at night, his, his secretary, Jonathan Hayes, would say he would be crying and saying, why, why, after he'd get like a bowel record, why? Yeah. You know, this was a guy who was remorseful every time blood was shed yeah there was a massacre or like it just he, this is a guy that got really involved he had a true conscience yeah he did and that's like again every time i'm reading about lincoln this does not sound like the narrative of a traitor or somebody that was trying to be a tyrant no that's all literally was like why why does this even have to be a thing well so, what lincoln i think realized also is you know you get up to that level and and you start playing around and, and he had to have been informed unlike maybe some of the presidents today you know right that he, you know the players, you know. I mean, just just as Benjamin Franklin and and our forefathers knew the players, you know, they they Lincoln came into power at a time when when presidents still knew the players. Now, right. you know, it's much more compartmentalized, Making murky. Yeah, but but uh, so he had to realize the involvement of you know this huge establishment that was a prominent part of society at the time. And what are you going to do? Break the news to everyone? Everyone's going to call you with the antichrist if you do that you know <laughs> so yeah i could see well, why he was the upset. Bases because they hide behind their charities and those special organizations to make them seem like they're the good guys but that's again that's perfect uh money laundering right there i mean you, you seem like a nice holy institution and same thing with the catholic church they're loaded and have more money than god but at the same time they're saying we need help when a church burns down in modern day it's like they said they still they're handing baskets around yeah you know what i mean i mean i was like wait what the Vatican is still sitting on as much gold as any country. I mean, literally. They are their own country. They are their own country. Exactly. Isn't that amazing? The Vatican, Washington, D.C., and that little part of London, they all have something in common, right? Yes. Uh, wonder yes. why they've made it the, made their own little stomping grounds there. For banking, the military, and the religion. I mean, if you got those three, you can control anybody. But right. to connect with the Catholic Church... Boots co-conspirator John Surratt, and this is where it gets good. You can actually Google John Surratt right now if you wanted to or show an image, and you will find him in a papal guard uniform from the 1800s. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And this is in the book, too. And after the assassination goes down, he goes back up to Montreal, Canada, hides with two Jesuit priests for five months, and then they put him on a steamer. Um, I believe it was called the Peruvian. And he goes to Liverpool, England. Now, remember, Liverpool, England is where they were building all these uh, blockade runner boats. Mm -hmm. Somebody spots him over here, over there, or he messages one of his buddies, and he basically says, oh, crap, I know he's part of they're, they're looking for this guy. There's a $100,000 bounty. So they make the call. They let them know, saying, hey, we got your guy over here. We know he's staying at this church. Do you want us to go apprehend him? Edward Stanton intentionally goofs up the whole freaking response, basically, like uh, it's not that's why he's there. No. that's why he was there right yep yeah now nope. I'll, I'll make sure this guy gets away and he goofs it all up at the same time president johnson who was also a mason and also was affiliated with booth back in tennessee they used to hang out and date some women mm -hmm. and a little sidebar he claims he was drunk at the night of the assassination 
what really occurred is that Booth got a letter from a, a, a woman that was uh, right next to the theater or whatever. It was close by. He used to hang out with her all the time. And she said, you know, I'll let you do anything you want with me. And he basically, what the, I can put together, he, he made her sleep with the president that night. The door was supposed to be open. The guy was supposed to go in, but he lost his nerve, didn't stab him. So to avoid scandal with sleeping with a promiscuous woman, he claimed I was drunk as opposed to admitting, I think I just got duped. I could have lost my own life during this incident. So wait, who did that now? Who, who president that? Johnson, the vice president. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, but he also was a Mason. Again, I think there's certain degrees of Masons where some of their clubs can work against each other or did at the time because, mm -hmm. um, remember, it's order through chaos. As You can have different views, you can have different opinions, but at the end of the day, we want our own, you know, we're going to get our end, end agenda across. So right. when he cancels this whole bounty on Surratt and company, that's incredibly suspicious, especially when you get a call that you've got the second guy that's probably the most, you know, involved character of this whole thing so yeah. this this fluke goes on he escapes he goes to a little town outside the vatican he joins the papal guard takes that photo and another independent private investigator felt the need to go down there trace him found him they uh the catholic church is like all right our hands are tied we can't keep you know hiding you sheltering so, okay yeah. yeah so they hand him over but he escapes again conveniently mm. they finally get him in egypt they bring him back he goes on to He went all the way to Egypt to hide, and they still they still went Cairo. Yep, and they pulled <laughs> him back to the U.S. He goes on trial. Uh, the guy Thomas Miley Harris, the guy that was recording all this in 1885 in his book, said every single one of the people that were on the jury were Catholics. <laughs> yeah, gets off, and he ends up going on tours for the rest of his life. When he dies, he's buried with four Cath the full Catholic Church royal honors. Wow. He was supposed to be the son of a shoe clerk. What did you do? Because that's only reserved for people who did great things for the church, like a saint or something. Yeah. What did you do? Wow. So what needs to be also noted is that out of all the countries in Europe that sent their condolences after Lincoln died, the only one that was silent was the Vatican. In 1866, Congress passed a law forbidding all ambassadorial funds to the Vatican. Wow, they were like, what's the oh, reason? Guys, until 117 years later, when Reagan goes to visit the Vatican. Wow, that is, yeah, crazy. that's what the real significance of all that was. And remember, Reagan went to Bohemian Grove, so when you start connecting those dots, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, it's all one big game. And you guys were fixing the connection that got ripped apart then, but you had to wait some time because if you did it right away, you're offering your, you know, Reagan was also dealing in. Uh, in considerably more money than previous presidents with this with the star wars uh and the 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 whole which ended up being a bit of a you know i mean the, the entire cold war was orchestrated and, and and continued for decades solely for you know this the the laundering of of money and, and of course some of it was put into um, these these weapons, but you know, once you know how to make them, then you know. I mean, the amount of money that Reagan funneled to the secret space program is enormous. Um, yeah. He's and of course it was all under the guise of you know, well, we have to compete with Russia. Meanwhile, the Rothschilds are the, are the ones funneling the nuclear secrets to Russia because you can't have a nuclear war if one side doesn't have nukes. Right. Right. Go America. Just like the Viet, you know, the Viet, the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, you know, we were funneling the, we, we, the Viet, the North Vietnam soldiers, even sometimes through Russia. This, this is how far the United States will go to keep a war going. We're like, keep right. the party going. We're, we're, we are like our, the R. Kelly of fucking war. Anything yeah. to keep the party going. You know, it's just, uh, it's insane. People have no idea the, the, the truth of, of these wars you know we've we've funded both sides of every war sometimes getting caught red-handed and just yeah like well, i don't know <laughs> it was, <laughs> this, you know i mean obama ha would have them drop the weapons off and the soldiers would be like but if we just leave them there then the opposite army is gonna get them and you know of course they're like follow your fucking orders you follow you do what you're told that's why you have your job right but like, I mean, 
it's just the amount of stupidity that it, there's just no there's no willpower right uh, right no, it's a shame but if people knew the truth they they would be shocked you know they would be shocked so that's fascinating that i you know i, I had no idea rome was so involved i should have known because they're they're involved in most things now it's funny that these Especially days the jesuits and, and the jesuits you know who probably have the worst reputation out of well the, a lot of them have bad reputation but the jesuits are kind of you know like there's such animosity for the jesuits and and i'm like so i've read a little bit about it but i don't i don't know a lot of work where, where that animosity comes from what the jesuits did to earn it because at I one could, point i could send you some links for that yeah, I would love to to learn more about it. But I know at one point, like, everyone seemed to be at war with the Jesuits. I was like, what the hell were the Jesuits? What yep. were they doing? Pissing everybody off? Yes, they were. A lot, a lot of, even Napoleon knew that he was probably going to be poisoned. That's why he had the liver issue. Um, that's why he couldn't, that's why he lost the Battle of Waterloo. He was dealing with, uh, sh like, it's not shingles, but it was some kind of disease where huh. he was crapping. And he couldn't sit on top of his horse and survey the battlefield. And that's why you're making out these bad calls about what to do. And that was from him trying to poison himself after uh, after the first time he got caught, he failed. But he's pretty convinced that the that later on in life that's that that's who was gonna do him in was the Jesuits because they always use poison as their uh, number one way of taking people out. And the Je like so what was the Jesuits who was who was telling the Jesuits what to do? What I mean, which which part of the elite we're controlling the Jesuits, I guess, is my question. That goes back to the Black Pope, and that's basically a guy who shadows the Pope, but he's the one making the calls. The real Pope, yeah. Yeah, he's the one making the real calls. And basically, that them and the Jesuits, they've had a frenemies relationship through the years. Oh, wow. um, the guy, Adam Weissop, when he left the Jesuit order, he's the oh, one. Oh, I know that name, yeah. Yeah, he's the one that said, that, like, you know, I'm going to create the Illuminati. And he ended up finding some Jewish um, masons that were went decided they wanted to go rogue, and they said we're going to infiltrate all the secret societies, and that way we'll be able to have our own little you know we'll we'll dictate the act yeah. of what goes on around the world. So a lot of times the Jesuits and the Masons would be like, all right, we'll shake hands on this one, but the next time I'm, gonna, we're, I'm not going to be right. friends with you. So there was a lot of double motivations going on, but the Catholic Church has been its own entity. Because they don't want to lose their religious grip and power over the people. So that's why they keep going after the activists. They keep going after people that are calling them out. I mean, I'm surprised Martin Luther survived. <laughs> yeah. That, that would genuinely surprises me. Because every time somebody started speaking out against the church, they had to silence them. It's, uh, it usually didn't take them long. You know, it, and it's just uh, at some point. There, there became, you know, well, now I know there's the rift was made during the Civil War. And, mm -hmm. and so I think in some ways the United States, in, in the same vein as the Church of England, created its own um, independent power here, at least for a while, that I think the Vatican and Rome was like, fuck those guys, we'll get them next time for now, you know. Um, right, right. You know, obviously still having influence and, and being involved in, in, the corporate matters in, in the way that the Vatican can be right. very clandestinely. But um, that makes sense to me, you know, because, well, I mean, the only thing that happened was the the, the rich folks in, in England and then eventually America were like, yo, f why are they, why are we doing, why don't we just do what they're doing? You know right. what I'm saying? Like, right. why give them all the money and power? You know what? Let's just create our own church. Called the Church of England, you know what I mean? Like, well, that's one thing. Why would you know how take not pay taxes? Yeah, you know how Rothschild came into power, right? In well, England, I know. I I heard that he was. So he was working with someone, um, and then they died, and he got an inheritance, right? And that's how he got the money. Yes, he got that money, and then that was during the French Revolution, or right before it, right? Right. And and so he figured out how to manipulate. This was the first time he was successfully, you know, built himself a fortune virtually overnight by crashing a market, right? Right. And he, so what happened was the battle, it was the Battle of Waterloo, right? I think it was a little Maybe bit prior. Maybe it was A little bit prior. Yeah. It was a big battle, right? Right. And, and of course, he had his 
f- part of his family um, right there on the ground, right? And he actually rode from the battle to be the first one, right? Because they knew they had one shot at this and they had a small window before news spread, right? Right. Go, tell, so t- finish the story for me. Tell, tell everyone what, what these, what so these guys what did. They did uh, the French... They basically spun the story in the War of 1812 that the French had landed on English soil. French army's going to be coming and taking up all of your freaking, you know, they're going to burn the city, yada, yada. Yeah. So it's all everybody, run, 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 run. And everybody's like, well, if I run, I, I want, you know, my, my, I have my business here, blah, blah, blah. So he's like, I'll buy it for you. I'll buy it for you. And he's on the dime. Yeah. He buys up square after square after square. These people all leave town. And the next thing you know, he's in charge of all these streets, all these businesses with that fortune. But a totally worthwhile investment because now you own the majority of England. So now you're known as the Lords of London. You're more powerful than the freaking English family because you have the money. I, I heard that he, 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 well, he even brought word that there was a massive defeat. Yeah. Right. And that, and, 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 and so. About the invasion. Yeah. That the invasion was successful and that it was, you know, it was a slaughter. And so that. I don't know if they were called stocks at the time, but basically right. everything dropped. And so he the the seed money he had inherited, he immediately started buying everything in it in it and everything he could that was of value right there. Yep. Um and then of course it, he had created the lie that they lost. You know, yep. the, the the fact was that there that they won. There was victory. So what happened was you know, there's like oh it was it was a mistake. It turned out we didn't lose. Yay, right. you know. Meanwhile, he had bought everything at fire sale prices. Yep. Um, reminds me a little bit of 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and then sold some of it back at normal prices, right. you know? So he's like, it's like playing blackjack, doubling down, doubling down, doubling down, doubling down, and then hitting blackjack. You know, that's how you make a lot of money in one hand. And that's right. exactly what it did. Sorry, my dog is barking. Um, yeah. And that's how the Rothschilds went from, you know, Small but they were players, and but they they but virtually overnight they went from you know to they went from to a a, a global force because they had strong armed all of England, and at the time England was one of the most powerful countries in the world. They basically put England in a in a place where they had to come to negotiate. Mm-hmm. And to this day, they still are calling the shots. And um, I'm not sure if you watched the part where I was talking about this um, with Nick, but there was a quote by um, General Cornwallis. And this was actually written in a book, but you can't find this now in the Library of Congress. You can find it in the book Bloody Zion by Edward Hendry. You actually might want to get him on here because a lot of the stuff I get about the Catholic Church, he's the one that compiled the book for about Lincoln. Um, he has this quote in there. And the guy wrote the book in 1781 called The Legions of Satan. And this guy says to Lincoln, I'm uh, sorry, Washington says within 200 years, this country will, he says, you might have won this war. You got your little revolution, but within 200 years, you'll be worshiping the Jewish religion and you're going to be freaking doing the bidding of the crowd. Wow. Makes that threat. And this matches now, if you rewind back to John D, he's the one that was practicing Enochian magic in the Elizabethan court that opposed mm-hmm. on that. And all his symbolism that goes back to the Tower of Babel, and the reason they built Babel where it was is because that's where the fallen Nephilim from Genesis six four that I mentioned the be- earlier, that's where they were locked up after their violation, creating the giant offspring that we read about in the Bible. That's why we build churches on top of freaking dead saints, and so because it's consult those dead spirits. So the whole concept of church buildings itself, totally not biblical, but. He also had the vision of having a whole empire of Christianity. When he was consulting the John D., when he was consulting the other side, they kept saying to him, we want all the religions to be one, and then that will that will instigate the apocalypse and the return of Christ. But in reality, these, ne- these Nephilim that are locked up, they, they want to come back out and have play day and cause problems. I don't know. But this, when Cornwallis says this quote, the guy who recorded it was a guy by the name of Colonel John Williams, and he was one of the first officers at West Point. Like the, the author said, he says, I looked up the guy, I tried to see where he was, if he was actual a real person, and he finds all this other evidence. He says, oh, I have fine credibility that this guy existed. And McCarthy gave a speech, Senator McCarthy, the McCarthyism from the 1950s. He gave a speech, and he quoted this, and they freaking silenced him for it. 
This is where it goes. Wow. Zionism, Rothschilds, all that. They freaking silenced him for calling this out. The star of David connects back to this. It's it's not the it's not connected to David. It's not connected to King Solomon. That's connected to the uh, Saturn, and Saturn is the star that connects to Nimrod. The pentagram is the one that connects to Ashtaroth or Satan, hey, man. his wife, and then the all-seeing eye that you see celebs do. That goes back to their son Tammuz. So there's a religion going on in this world that people are totally unaware of that's still totally. going on today. But yeah, yeah. and they, they and you got to worship at the altar of it if you want to be Rihanna. Well, yes. and maybe Rihanna's yeah, but Beyonce and Jay Z certainly. Some of them are just you know flagrant. Yeah, I mean, and people are like, oh, they're, oh, they're just staying okay. Yes. <laughs> I, it's so hard for me. I do that all the time at work. I'm just like, all right, fr French kiss, French kiss. I, I'm going to do yeah. the chef's kiss. Do that instead. Because I can't, like, now that I know what that means, it also means 666. That's how many times it was around. Oh, now I see it. Yeah, I was wondering why they do that. Yeah. 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 So, so and these people, when they when they do this, you know, they're, they, they, they think that they're worshiping. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's, there's different facets of it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. some of them believe that they're worshiping this this entity some of them even believe that that entity you know is is evil so to right. speak you know and and uh, you know and and that's some of the very darker sides of this and others believe that oh it's just you know that the all-seeing eye represents knowledge and that they, right. that they believe that satan is is lucifer lucifer is the enlightened one you mm -hmm. know they don't see him necessarily as a rival of God, but they worship him as their role model almost, you know, right. because it's enlightenment that they see. Um, and, and so you have all these, and you know, some of the darker shit, like what's her face that, that who's having people, you know, do, you know, fake eating where they're eating people, but it's, you know, yeah. most of the time it's fake when it's celebrities. Yeah. But that, that, that part is very, occult and dark and but it's but it's prevalent you know don't get me wrong it's right. prevalent and it's and it's disgusting and and in that part very much endorses some of the pedophilia you see you know that that is rampant among these people and why there's a list right now with the you know a long list that yeah. has a bunch of people on it who are very famous some of them statesmen some of them actors some of them athletes um who who participate in this now yeah. you know the question is, at what point do they start? How did they get pressured into it? You know, where the, it, it's like, but but it is a net that that right. is cast. But right. if you want to be in this club, um, you got to play. You got to play by their rules. If not, right. then you don't you don't make it very far. And that's the same with a lot of politics, unfortunately. But um, you know, the star of David. So this is how Brandon and I got into this initial discourse. I was like. Because he in his post, I was talking about, um, you know, I love talking about World War II and yep. our our involvement in that, and and people, it's it's shocking for people to realize how involved we were with so many aspects of World War II. But you know, I the, the part that I get a little fuzzy about, and I'm like, I know that Hitler looked up to Henry Ford, and Henry Ford and Hitler were, you know, they were pals, and they were they wrote letters, and he had yep. a life size bust of Hitler, and Hitler had factories right in Germany for the German army, for the Germans. Yep. And, and, you know, he was given Adolf a good deal uh, all around. So they were buddies. And uh, in fact, a lot of the the brand names uh, of our society were very much pro-Hitler. And, and, you know, you have people constantly want to make the argument that, well, it's because there was so much money in it. And I'm like, okay, sure. But at the same time, you know, people keep trying to tell me like, oh, IG Farben, they maybe they were making pesticides and i'm like um and they just happened to work really well for a gas chamber and i was like um 1942 you know all the pesticides were organic in the 30s and then in the 40s we saw the advent really i mean of some of the chemicals that were from war being put to more of an industrial use right one of them being pesticides but i'm like you know, regardless, these people are business moguls. You know, they're, they, they've they come into a very high degree of success for their time by knowing what the fuck they're making. Not right. by, like, I heard it's, invest, it's a good investment. Just give them the money. I'm like, what? Wait, what? If, if, if 
your job is to make chemicals and you're investing in that company, you're going to find out what they're making. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to be a misery. Oh, we really didn't know they were going to make that. I'm like, what fucking world do you live in that you could be so naive to imagine like that? Well, Henry Ford didn't know the trucks were going to be used against the Americans. Bullshit. He didn't know. He was selling trucks to the Americans too. He didn't care. Yep. You know what I mean? That I mean, people are just incredibly naive when they think about these things. Um, but I don't believe for a second that the, Zy the Zyklon B gas they used in chambers was a, a pesticide that they that they ended up converting. I believe it was gas designed to kill people, yeah. and that it, that's what it was made for. Um, I don't know if you know anything about any of that bullshit, but um, you know I keep seeing a little bit make excuses. But you know my question is, Hitler was propagandized into believing i think in a lot of ways that the enemy were the jews that the, that the new world order the illuminati consisted of a solely jewish idea and and concept and movement and force and that and i don't and i don't know how accurate that statement is but my my question is like you have the zionists right yeah. which as i understand it consists of the Rothschilds, you know, yes. uh, primarily, right? But the Rothschilds are also one of the biggest players and key elements of the Illuminati, mm -hmm. um, and they have been for quite a while, right? So how do you, uh, you know, in one of your posts, you were like, the Zionists are going to, are fucking over the industrialists. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> how and 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 why and how does there ever be get to be a degree of separation between those two factions you know what i mean they seem to be part and parcel and in fact using each other to play nation states against each other well tell me what i'm missing that's what i tell a lot of people is that they, they don't seem to realize when you're hearing a little Illuminati, you're hearing about the knights of the golden circle you're hearing about uh the knights of columbia or whatever it is a multi-faceted designed intentionally hydra because if one mm -hmm. goes down, another one can keep on carrying on the baton of what the end goal mission. It's it's a lo it's a long game conspiracy, and they can go on for centuries and years. Yeah. And when I'm making that claim, um, you might want to look up the series uh, Adolf Hitler: The Greatest Story Never Told. Yeah, I but started watching that shit. I was like, "Come on, man!" I I, I mean, it seemed like such a fluff piece. I was trying it, to watch it. It does. It does. But I start connecting it. Um, you have to watch Doctor Walter Veit. Um, he's got, uh, dogmas and doctrines. He was doing a whole expose exposing the symbolism behind the Masonic stuff. So this, yeah. I, I compiled like a 13 minute thing. It's like a snippet from that. It's a snippet from his lecture. And there's a snippet from a movie, uh, Nuremberg where the actor says specifically, Brian Cox, he says to the other actor, he says, and where were you during the Jewish Freemasonry, blah, 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 blah. He specifically says Is black and white. Jewish Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. And I, th when I watched that bit in the movie, I said, well, I, okay, I understand the Jewish thing because Holocaust and all that, but what do you mean about this Freemasonry aspect? Yeah. Freemasonry actually goes back to the Knights Templar. And again, when you looked up the pirate post that I just did, it makes huge sense here. And when you, there's another uh, book that I just bought. I'm forgetting the, the guy's name. I could probably send it to you later if you so prefer. And he was talking, he makes a strong case that it was Jews that started it after the Khazars. He's, they're the ones that started up the um, the Knights Templar. And when they found this this ring down there over in, uh, during the Crusades, it, the the sigil that you see the, this um, that's modernly on the flag yeah. of Israel, the Star of David, that's supposed to be King Solomon's ring. And it was said that he used that ring to control the Nephilim that were under uh, Euphrates to help build the new temple, the King Solomon's temple. So when the Knights Templar found this, they found out, wait, we have access to demonic powers and great forces underneath? Like, what, what do we need Christianity for anymore? So they started spitting on crosses and stuff like that. And then they formed the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, which connects to Portugal mm -hmm. and Scotland. And this is where Freemasonry came into beginning. So there's that aspect. Um, wow. Yeah, the the book. There's a Scottish in. right. There's a Scottish right Freemasonry building, uh, maybe like twenty miles from here. It's a big building. I was like, what the fuck? The sign is right out front. It's like Scott Scottish something Freemasonry. I was like, 
I wonder if you just knock. <laughs> I was like, what? It's crazy. There's a big old building. I was like, right. I drove by. I thought I was like seeing things. I was like, huh? I guess they still have meetings, you know? Um, they still do. And there's yeah. several levels of doctrine. So, like, if you're level one, you're only going to get the charities. Right. This is what people talk about like. politics. And if you're a good person, you know. Right. They, they, right. People are like, oh, listen, I'm friends with uh, so many. They're good, good people. I'm like, that's because you're a good person, my friend. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, you, they're not bringing you up. Uh, you know, you're going to make so far, and that's it. You know, that's the way it works. Obviously, right. that's the way. It works. But it's hard for people to believe who have been lifelong members and that's what they want they they know those people will be genuine when they speak about their freemason friends they know right. that people will hear them and be like no man johnny's a freemason johnny's got the biggest heart in the world yeah right. of course. you know what i mean that's it's so smart the way they have it set up and compartmentalized um yep. that most people will never believe it but it's a shame and that's I mean, it's like, like, human like, growth yeah who's, who's gonna think people who are getting charities and, and, and money for cancer kids is actually yeah trying to kill me on a global scale because it's so, it's such a f small percentage. You know, it's like right. the top two to three percent, right? If that, maybe two percent. You know, are you Don't familiar? The, are okay. you familiar with the Talmud? Dude, it sounds super familiar. If We're not, just reading it, it. this this would give a lot of credence and understanding than the mentality of Jewish supremacy. So, if anybody, like, this is my first question. If somebody says, "Oh, you're anti-Semitic," I'll ask them, "Are you pro Talmud?" They don't know what that book is. I'm going to say, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about because that's a supremacy book. And mm -hmm. you don't know what that book talks about. Then that means you support Epstein's Island. That book right. says you can have sex with a six-year-old girl. You can have sex with a three-year-old boy. Damn. Yeah. It says it point blank. Jen that feels to mood. Well, I've, I've seen that book referenced, I don't know, a hundred times. And I'm always like, it's to mood. Um, yes. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, supremacy book but it's 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 jewish supremacy right and it basically, basically is i see oh my god That's they're still crazy. stuck in the mentality of the days after joshua and mm. any any gentile aka goyim so when you're watching that clip from uh jesse ventura's um conspiracy, the conspiracy stuff, was the one about the vaccines they said it's almost time for the great culling the what Great culling, the culling of a herd, and they call us goyim. This is again cross-reference research. Okay, wow. so culling of the herd. The, the Talmud basically says that as long as someone else swings the hammer and puts the nail into that individual, and we didn't do it, that was somebody else's actions. We're absolved of any crime, as long as somebody else makes the decision. Yeah, to do that, you read my mind. We're, we're not liable. We're God's people. We're still God's people. Jesus doesn't count. And they have, in the Talmud, they basically said Jesus basically repented after they put him on the cross and said, oh, bless the Jews, yada, yada. And dispensational Zionism, this was created by the Schofield Bible, and I'm going to explain something significant with that because this connects to Rothschild, says that Jesus is going to come down on earth and he's going to restore an earthly kingdom with the Jews. That's not biblical at all. It says you can't come back into heaven until you accept Jesus Christ as, as, as a savior, because you're neither Jew nor Greek anymore, you can come back into the fold. Right. A lot of people in the in their preaching right now, they don't count for Jeremiah 3, 8, where it says, I've given Israel the bill of divorce. The Ten Commandments wasn't just Ten Commandments of law, as it was a marriage ceremony. This is what I'm expecting from you. And they violated it continually. Can they come back now via Christ? Yes, but the old marriage is gone. Right. That's where I would go into the communion aspect and the Mary Magdalene thing where um, it states specifically that in Jewish culture, what the dad would do, he would, he would get a, a young man in town, make sure he had a good standing, he, he, had, you know, he could provide for his daughter, think like the fiddler on the roof. I'm mm -hmm. making sure that this guy is good for you because I want to make sure you're going to have a good upbringing, whatever. What would happen then is that they would bring the young man over, they bring the daughter over, they pour a little glass of wine, he would hand it to the man, he'd drink of it. They then take the same glass and hand it to the daughter. Now, it was here where she could respectfully refuse, I don't mm -hmm. approve of this match, I don't want to marry this guy. Totally was fine, it was honorable, she has the right to make that decision, we'll move on. It wasn't going to be a forced arranged marriage, she had the choice. All right. She accepted it. What would happen then in Jewish culture is that they would add on to the family house and give her an extension because now she's going to be inducted into the family. Right. So when Christ is saying, this is my body, drink of it, blah, blah, blah. 
I go to prepare a place for you at my father's house. We're making so the like Mark is literal. Yes, you're making the conscious choice of a marriage ceremony, accepting wow. God's son. It's it's a God giving His son. Now you have to make the acceptance of this relationship. So the whole aspect of communion we've totally diluted yeah. from what it was context and cult and culture. It, but when you understand it, you're like, oh, this, it, why am I beating myself up saying thank you for dying on the cross for me? <laughs> But when it's a marriage ceremony, you should be having like, you know, a party and remember. It's, I mean, and they're like, it's a celebration. Be like, but but everyone seems to be in mourning. <laughs> right. Right. You know what I mean? Like literally. On this thing. <laughs> it's crazy. It's it's so confused. And that's why I feel like they're 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 losing power and ground. And you know They, they are. They are they're and, and it's that is systematic, you know, and and, yep. and RFK Jr. came out and said they're gonna be coming after religious exemptions particularly yep. in the north and my god they they've virtually eliminated them you know there's no religious exemptions anymore for anything right um, and they then they they were like we'll show you who's in charge churches are shut down walmart open churches not so much bars we'll show you where our priorities are you know um which is fascinating that people who are quote of faith were just like oh we have to stay home <laughs> yeah or you have to wear you know, try that shit a hundred years ago to see what happened. You know? Yeah. Um it, that was the biggest the biggest thing. I kept talking to my pastor. I was like, I don't like we're supposed to be preaching a, a yeah. story of not fearing death. Yeah. That's the core of our thing. But we're wearing an emblem of fear on our face <laughs> yeah. constantly. And I had a hard time when in junior church because I'm like, I I, I can't I feel like a hypocrite. I yeah. do it. <laughs> well, you see why. That, that is exactly why religion has to be weeded out because absolutely you know it, it 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 gives people an anchor to something greater than themselves and and that's a problem you know right it's a big problem especially when it's there's zeal there um that's a big problem so that's you, you see it's happening and it's like churches are closing people don't go anymore people don't go to work anymore let alone church you know right. no one wants to go anywhere right. anymore but that's what they want um it's easier for them but man this is uh we're running a little low on time. This has been fascinating. Just two more things. With, Tell me. Go ahead. Yeah, because it'll connect to stuff I said I was going to say it. Um, the one with um, the forming of the IRS. I was talking about it earlier, but I said it does connect um, with the banking thing. Oh, yeah, Rothschild agent. Jacob Schiff. He was the guy that went to Jekyll mm -hmm. Island with the senator. Yeah. Yeah. And he is the great-grandfather of present-day Adam Schiff. Yeah, I, I'm just saying, when you look into this stuff, but to go further, uh, the stuff that what Hitler's mindset was, when you're looking at the this, this star that he put on the Jewish shoulder, oh, yeah. um, that's basically, the, the whole symbolism of that is saying the cultural elements are more powerful than God. You look up the Walter Reith video, um, you can find it on Odyssey and I think on YouTube, Morals and Dogma, and it basically was basically branding them saying, you guys think you're better than everybody else in our culture. You think you can control my banking system and stuff like that. He was pissed off, especially after World War One, because in the first 45, 52 minutes of the Hitler thing, if you just want to tolerate that much, it talks yeah. about it, where um, in Germany was kicking England's butt. They had him on their knees. I think it was in October. And basically Rothschild writes an aid, uh, a, a letter to um uh, America and says we basically need your help if you give us Palestine yada yada and this is a from from a Zionist perspective he says you we, we want the promised land you get that for us we'll be a done deal and that's where Hitler was saying we got backstabbed and they actually yeah. created a whole program um the Tel Aviv Accord I believe where Jews would put money into a thing they would be shipped back to the Palestine Israeli region yeah, yeah. and then the money that they invested into this would be given back to them after America stuck their nose into the war, that prop that program got dissolved. That was going on from like the 30s until like 42, 41. Cool. Hitler's running that program. That was by Germany. By Germany, right? Yeah, because they were already having a problem with Jew Jewish businesses boycotting them, and they were also were the ones that were introducing uh, what was it? But pornography and and cinema and on stages and plays, and a lot of the <laughs> Germans for. We're like, what what the heck are you doing? And on top of that, or like America, what are you doing to our banking system? 
we're having a big right. problem with this. It's a monopoly and they weren't appreciating it. And now if you're going to be like, oh, come on, you're, you're jumping the gun. Uh, I did a post. I read I read this guy's whole interview. It's from the book Bloody Zion. But this is a por portion of his interview of revealing it. He wanted money for uh, banking, uh, d gambling thing. And it goes, our power has been created through uh, the manipulation of the ma national monetary system. The Federal Reserve System has fitted our plan nicely since it is owned by us, but the name implies that it is of the government institution from the outset. Our purpose was to confiscate all the gold and silver, replacing them with worthless, non-redeemable paper notes. We Jews have put issue upon issue to the American people, and we promote both sides of the issue as confusion reigns. With their eyes fixed on the issues, they fail to see who is behind every scene. We Jews toys with the American people as a cat toys with a mouse. He was murdered 30 days after this interview. This was back in uh, 1976. In Tur Did he really fucking say that, though? Or oh, yeah. was it? Both. He admitted the whole thing, and then they were like, dude, shut up. This is he would be, he was talking about how oh so he just was a narcissist and, and and could not keep his mouth oh I think I read about this guy he they were like shut up you yeah you're, you're get you like you know we're not we're not invincible and this right. guy kept spouting off because he thought it basically was acting like the war was won and, and right. we were like like dude we're they were like dude we're still fighting you can't tell him right this here. shit and he was like I am the smartest we are the greatest you know and they were like. Sit down and shut up. I, I was reading about this cat. Wow, that's crazy. I can send you the audio reading I'm sorry I did for that. But yeah, and it was like, you yeah. all blew the lid. And this is what Hitler was talking or the whole issue that was going on there. He didn't have the Jewish problem until they basically saying, we can't allow this Palestinian deal to keep going on where you're getting people out of here. Wow. I mean, it's still it's so much. It's still a little confusing, but... Oh, I could go um, on. If you want to have me back on explaining the star religion. That's what I'll, I'll have to do um, because I, I got to go get dinner ready. But uh, Totally, totally. We'll, we'll have to do it again, my friend. It's been it's been real. We covered a lot, um, and we, we, there's a lot more we can we can get into, so we'll, we'll do it again sometime soon. Uh, I appreciate all your time and your knowledge. Um, you know, Brandon is, is a young man. He's born in 1994. Uh, so to, to see a young man who is so well read and and just just so fervent about about acquiring actual knowledge and not the bullshit that they teach you in school, it just gives me a lot of hope for the youth. Um, and it's it's a pleasure, man, to know you. So uh, we'll Appreciate be in touch for sure. Awesome, Appreciate man. having me on. It's it's been an absolute blast. And uh, to everyone who who remained with us. Thank you guys so much. We'll have Brandon back on again. As always, question the answers. And, um, you know, we'll be in touch when this is going to come out, Brandon. All right, brother. You take care.